Hello and welcome to the Breaking Muscle podcast. I'm your host, Tom McCormick, and today I'm joined by Andrew Coates, and we're going to discuss how to build a personal brand and a following in the fitness industry. Andrew is a coach who has spent a decade honing his craft in the gym and recently has branched out to become a prolific content creator. In this episode, we will discuss how he manages to juggle coaching 35 plus hours a week with weekly podcast episodes, writing articles and posting daily on social media to grow his following. So if you're interested in doing the same and blowing up your following, then this is a must listen. Without any further delay, it's on with the podcast. All right, guys. So as I said in that intro, absolutely delighted, stumbling over my words already, delighted to be joined by Andrew today. Andrew, thank you for taking the time to have a chat. Um, Thanks for having me on here. It's fun to be on the other side of the microphone. And here I am. There you go. Exactly. I've I've given you the uh, the, the jitters already. We're, we're stumbling over our words. Awesome start from both of us. And, and you know, you made reference to that. You have done. I think you said off air 161 episodes of your podcast. So, a bit of a podcast yeah. pro. Yeah, weekly podcast. So it's a little bit of fun for sure. And like you were saying off air, these while incredible when we can share them with the end listener. The great real value in them is a you're connecting with and getting to know people and then you're learning for yourself. And if you're doing it for that reason, everything that you get out of it amazing and everybody else just gets to go along for the ride and enjoy it. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I think uh so, you know, my, my my goals when when doing this and hosting this offering to host this podcast obviously i wanted to get good information to out to other people but let's be fair it's given me the chance to chat to to great coaches the world over and 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 basically i'm you know fascinated by what uh, you guys have to say so i'm learning and yeah yeah, everyone else is getting to listen in on the conversation which i think is uh, absolutely brilliant so um you know we we're going to talk a a little bit about obviously training and and things here but we we want to take a dive into your progression through the industry how you've gone about things and i think there's some bigger themes that will be key takeaways for anyone else who's an aspiring coach who wants to you know to start making some impact outside of their their gym but before we sort of uh dive that way first of all just give us a little bit of background into your journey into fitness how you got into training how long you've been doing this Oh, this month is 10 years. I, you know, yesterday as the time of recording, uh, I put up a post about it being my 10 year anniversary in the industry and I fell into it. Um, I was asked by, uh, you know, some contacts, off the gym floor where I worked out to come and be a trainer. And I initially declined and scared at first, but it turned out work and over time it became something I was incredibly passionate about. If anyone's ever read, Kel Newport's book, um, was it, uh, oh, let me remember the title. I apologize. So good. They can't ignore you. Great book. He talks more about finding your passion within what you're doing versus this myth of always blindly following your passion. And so things worked out, but I've been a high school athlete and, you know, dabbled in and screwed around with the gym a little bit, had a weight bench set in high school, but never really got serious about it until I was about 24. And then I took it really seriously kind of turned life around and it had been treating me really, really well. And then much later on in life, as I started bouncing through careers, I have a bachelor of commerce degree, a business degree. And, you know, it just, I fell into it, as I said, and then it was, you know, a very long time on the gym floor, head down, working sessions upon sessions. And I'm still a high volume session performer, if that makes sense. But, um, I wasn't particularly, concern with quote brand building or in the space that I, I think we are both in right now, we're both teenage writers amongst other things. I would look at people who were teenage writers, uh, you know, people like uh, Dean Somerset, who actually happened to work for the same company I did back then in Edmonton, Alberta, or your Eric Box or Lee Boyce or Brian Cron and Ben Bruno's name. That list goes on and on and on. Eric Cressy, Tony Jellicor. And you look at those people as this tier of, wow, these are, you know, the successful big names in our industry. And it's very, very hard to imagine kind of standing, you know, on any sort of even footing with them. So I just, again, head down. Uh, and outside of, I mean, back when I first started, there was no Instagram. So it's not like we were trying to build a following on that. But I would write on Facebook and treat Facebook like a blog. And, you know, I was fairly consistent with that before a lot of people even were. And eventually I went uh, private. I left the old company. There's a number of issues with them. And I've been an independent contractor at a friend's facility ever since of my own business. It's been wonderful. And of course, that 
earnings have increased as a result of that. You know, everything's going into your own pocket. And along the way, a good friend of mine, my friend Dean Guido, he asked me, hey, you know, we should do a fitness podcast. I said, okay, sure. Hell, why not, right? Humble beginnings. And that turned into interviewing, you know, people who are now friends of mine, like Sohi Lee and Mike Izzard held fairly quickly. And then that sort of blew up following right away. This is all, you know, this is over three years ago. So I think everybody has a podcast now. It sometimes feel like, and I, and I think it's actually a great vehicle for a lot of people, but it wasn't quite what you'd say. We feel like saturated. And then, so that gained some traction pretty quickly. And then I also started traveling to fitness conferences, which is where I met a lot of people. Again, Eric Bach was one of the people I met at one of the first ones. Uh, and there's a long list of people on that. And that led to doors opening and greater, you know, awareness in the industry. And I kept meeting more people, traveling to more events. And with time, that led me to uh, becoming Facebook friends with Danny Sugart, who is one of the editors at T Nation. And I invited her to come on the podcast as a guest because I love Danny's writing. And rather quickly, she turned around and and asked me rather sheepishly, you know, hey, would you consider, you know, being a, a contributor to T Nation? Now I'm thinking to myself, this is like one of those pipe dreams that you couldn't even imagine, right? You're know, reading this stuff like, oh, imagine just one day writing for these guys, never in a million years. So I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Like, I'm going to say no to that. So, you know, almost two years of writing for those guys has been been sort of, it's it's prestigious. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with valuing. Every once in a while you get to see someone who will poo-poo on them or say, oh, you know, these two different articles you put out in days in a row say the opposite thing. It's like, oh, you're missing kind of the points a little bit. Different contributors, different perspectives. And it's a great resource to you know, sift through what we would call really great ideas versus ideas that may not have a lot of value to you. So if you're just blindly accepting everything that you're reading, even from the people that you hold up on a pedestal as a guru, you know, you're probably going to get yourself in a little bit of trouble eventually because I don't think anybody's infallible. So that kind of led to where we are now. And then this past year, as you mentioned, uh, I said, all right, well, I'm doing all this other sort of stuff. And, you know, as silly as it sounds as a metric for evaluating people, uh, Instagram is where people look and evaluate people for how worthy they are to follow or, or engage with. And so, you know, I invested the effort in, in daily thought sharing content creation uh, to where that following has grown rather rapidly. And uh, the goal is to hit that magical 10K mythical mark by about Christmas when you get your swipe up. And then my podcast, instead of going here, go to this link and then go to this link and then go to this link, which we know with our websites, if you create. So you have a simpler process and it's a little more accessible. So there's a practical idea there. But it's also, you know, and I think most of the people listening to this are probably fitness professionals, right? You get a lot of them, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But certainly very enthu enthusiasts or, or actively involved as a coach, yeah. Right. So, you know, it's it's nice and fluffy and wonderful to think that something like a follower count doesn't matter, just as, and this is a touchy subject, or how you look as a fitness professional doesn't matter. But, uh, and, and your knowledge at the end of the day is what matters most, truly. But humans are still judgmental creatures, informed first impressions, and the shape that you're in, and unfortunately, the number of followers you have on social media is a credential, you know, a first look credential that people will evaluate or judge you based upon. So if you have it within your ability to improve both of those, um, you know, without taking shortcuts, you know, do it as part of a, a habit-based lifestyle, you know, that's only going to serve you very well in the long run. And if you're struggling with it, well, you know, this is where you can reach out to someone who's been doing it that uh, you respect, you have a relationship with and, and ask them how they've been doing with it, because it, it's not impossible. It feels daunting, but the exercise of just putting in the work is also uh, quite valuable. And I've, I've enjoyed it a lot this year with the Instagram. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think there's well a few key takeaways there, but f first things first is you put the time in on the gym floor uh, with your own training, but then also training others and from a variety of uh, different, you know, backgrounds or goals, right? So the people you train, um, it's not like you've just got one specific niche. You've always trained, I know, like uh, elite athletes or whatever. You train, you know, various people, which helps, I think, actually, before you niche down, it's quite good to train that broad spectrum. And then you can find the sort of people you really enjoy working with, whether that's a personality character or trait or characteristic or specifically goals that you like working with people towards. But then you learn so much from people from different different things and that helps you refine that and then you get your own 
kind of identity in terms of okay this is so if, yeah these are the principles i'm going to hang my hat on and then then i'm comfortable now sh- sh- yeah sharing this and spreading this wider is that fair absolutely so i don't work with competitive bodybuilders i put a couple of people up on stage and once after about one round and a little bit outside you know direct dieting work and posing work because i don't know shit about the posing side then it's like all right we're going to find you a coach that i trust that's going to take a good good care of you and i don't train competitive powerlifters because i'm also not a competitive powerlifter you know for for a guy my size i'm 260 pounds my totals would be fairly mediocre in terms of powerlifting world stuff i grew up under bodybuilding culture but also again i just do it because i like it so uh outside and i don't have any background in olympic lifting so i don't mess with those things but that leaves a broad array of general population clients like you said and i do work with a fair number of young athletes uh you know i've got a a young hockey player in the whl i've been working with for a few years up in edmonton alberta you know you're not it's it's not a, a a hotbed of a lot of stuff it's not like i'm working with nba basketball players in california like ben bruno does but uh, I like working with a broad array of people. You know, I have some older adults, a couple of guys in their seventies who are retired, and they're actually incredible to work with. Mm-hmm. Like you said, it, it gives you a, a broad array of skills and experience. And you hinted at it too. I think a lot of people are in a big rush to niche down, and I think that can be very, very good depending on you and the individual. But I've never felt compelled to do so, and I don't really. Yeah, you have to follow ultimately what suits you best. And, and I enjoy working with uh, a broader array of people. Mm-hmm. Okay, actually, so uh, thinking of that or mentioning that niching down, in, in my uh, experience, niching down online is if you're looking to drive online clients, that's that's a thing and probably something you need to c- commit to. In person, let's be fair, your physical location is going to filter down the people you can and can't work with um, to a great degree. Now, so from my perspective, uh, I work in the city of London uh, near the square mile. So I train a bunch of guys who work in finance and law in person, but online I have my own niche and that's uh, skinny guys that's, that are struggling to build muscle. Yeah, that, that's kind of the two things. Now, there's a lot of crossover because they all basically want to look better naked. So... We, you know, talking about that niche thing in terms of you growing your social media, your the presence from articles. Are you thinking because I want to drive online clients? Are you thinking because I just want to uh, create a bigger brand for me? Maybe I'm going to move into the education space, training trainers, or is it just a case of I haven't really thought that far ahead, but I want to put some put some information out into the world? Which which one of those is it? Pretty so. No. One is I don't have a grand passion for the online training the way a lot of people like yourself do. You just really thrive and excel in that space. I like the in-person work. Um, that's my preference. I've got some great friends in the industry. Or I, I don't know if you know who PJ Street is. He's also a, a, a quiet T Nation contributor. Great guy. You know, he'll work with hundreds of online clients. And I'm just like, like my mind is blown at the idea of managing, you know, I, it's over a hundred anyway, for sure that he works with. And he's very passionate about, you know, making the online experience better than the in-person experience. He's good at it. That's not for me. I, I like the gym floor. I think I always will. I'll be a bit more of a Charles Staley type who's still working with clients in person as I get up into my sixties and, and beyond. Uh, so I think again, it's like the growth of the Instagram and some people think, Oh, it's, it's yucky to care about, you know, growing a, a following or, you know, you use dirty words like influencer. I'm not a fan of that word either, but it, it's okay to grow a brand in the industry. And in fact, I think it's actually really important, especially if you ever do aspire to grow beyond just the gym floor space. And a lot of our contemporaries and people who came before us have done exactly that. I actually share a lot of information I, and I write uh, some articles that are geared towards, you know, career based, you know, support for trainers, but I don't, I'm not interested in becoming a business coach. I'm not particularly interested in that side of the education. I mean, perhaps one day, you know, presenting and, and obviously writing articles for Teen Nation is still, you know, educational. That There's definitely that. But it, it's not necessarily a direction I'm like, oh, I need to go in that way too and again get off the gym floor. I really just like being on the gym floor and I enjoy the idea of reaching more people, you know, more people reading my stuff, listening to the podcast, following my social media. And like you said, in C, it just gives you room to move in a direction if you finally decide at a certain point, hey, you know, I'm more interested in this all of a sudden. 
Um, you know, you've got, uh, I mentioned Mike Isertel earlier, who used to be a university professor and now has, you know, kind of stepped away from that and just runs Renaissance periodization. And then Lee Boyce and Matthew Ibrahim is another guy who writes with us. These guys are interested in becoming professors. So they're both adjunct professors at colleges. So different people want to go in different directions with the career. There's no one formula or one size fits all place that you're supposed to be in. And I think right now, if you are on the gym floor and you aspire to be, build a bigger brand, I think that is a great thing to work towards. And I think you should work hard at it. I think you should still be dedicated to the gym floor and your client in front of you is still the most important thing in the world. And a lot of the stuff that you can create and share that will help you build a brand long form content can and should be drawn from the in client experience and to enhance the in client experience. If you come from that place, you're going to have a, you know, a lifetime of, of ideas and material. And don't worry if your ideas don't feel like they're brand new. Some of the most successful people, uh, writers, uh, you know, quote, fitness influencers, people in the online space, they are fantastic at you know, taking relatively simple concepts and then nothing revolutionary and rehashing them in different forms and repeating them. And ultimately, you know, if you share the same idea, you know, 10 times in a row across 10 months, well, there are new followers coming in in month nine and 10 that haven't seen month one and two. Mm -hmm. There are people who in month one and two, it wasn't, they weren't in a place where it could click with them. And all of a sudden, after a bit of repetition or some sort of change in their life, now that same concept really grabs onto them and they run with it. Yes. Yeah. 100%. I think that's something you have to realize, uh, repetition, especially with the Instagram game. Um, you know, of all your followers, only so many of them see it anyway, even if they're, they're engaged. So they, they may well, they may well have been there the whole time, but they just didn't see that post. And you have to put that out there five, six times before, uh, it gets in front of them. So, uh, not being afraid of, of repeating yourself. And after all, there's only so many different things. I mean, you know, the, the principles are the same. It's just how you articulate it. And then I think, as you say, one of the things is you don't necessarily have to reinvent the world. There's plenty of people who have made a good writing career and, and all their, and this is not a criticism, but why you use the word all they're good at, but what they're amazingly good at is taking something that someone else has uh, conceived, but they are, they can explain it to the layperson better. So they can take that idea and make it so that the person who's reading this can immediately apply it. And that's a huge skill. Rather than having to come up with revolutionary training programs, if you can just say, this is, you know, this is a concept A and, and I'll explain it to you in this way so you can use that, that's, that's a hugely valuable skill. And I think there's lots of people that that's, that's their skill and have built great writing careers with that. Um, and then quickly on the, on the online element, I wanted to, wanted to jump in, uh, because anyone that's listening to this, if you're thinking you want to be an online coach as someone who does it, it's really tough. Uh, and uh, you mentioned PJ, his, uh, approach of trying to make it better than the in-person. I think you've got to strive for that. Otherwise you won't be effective as an online coach. So if you're thinking this is the ticket to the easy life of sitting on the beach, uh, training people, then it really isn't. And I would also say, in my opinion, to be honest, you need to have been a good in-person coach first to then really be, have a chance of excelling as an online one because it's it's much much harder. You don't get that interaction with people, and you it's you know you pick up body language as well as what they're saying when you're with someone online. You have to really read between the lines or have great systems in place to to be able to do that. And so, uh, I think that's an important lesson for people that are, you know thinking, oh, this is this is my ticket to basically being able to pay be paid a fortune for training myself and then sitting on a laptop uh, having a coffee every now and again. It's not it's not going to work out that way. There's something important to consider too, and I've written on this myself. And Jonathan Goodman of the Personal Trader Development Center, obviously his brand is online training. Uh, he's been saying the same thing. More and more coaches will be getting into the online space earlier in their careers. And we have to be prepared for that. And that means there's more competition. And obviously anyone who does it well is passionate about it. You know, the quality of your work and your ability to brand yourself and reach people is going to set you apart. So it, it isn't worthwhile complaining about or being negative about, you know, quote, new online coaches. At the same time, if you're fairly new to it, well, if you don't have the same volume of on the gym floor experience, then it is on you to work very, very hard to get as good as possible at it. And you can pour yourself into it as a fairly inexperienced on the floor coach and do well online. And I think it's a bit of a, of this gatekeeper syndrome that 
the old guard of the industry do possess to say, if you ever hear anyone saying, oh, you know, you need five years of on the gym floor experience, right? Or some sort of arbitrary number. Well, that isn't going to hold up very well anymore because the internet and social media has democratized, you know, coaches access to the end users. It's not like everything was gate kept through commercial gyms and there's a small elite tier of people that, oh, you see the names on Teen Nation, they're the people you go and online train with. So it would be a very wise idea to, instead of sort of looking down upon anyone who's fairly new in that space, instead you can be someone who creates information shares to help that tier, especially if you see yourself as an educator long term. Well, if you belittle anyone who's fairly new to that world, well, you're missing an opportunity to actually do what you want to do long term and be a really great role model and mentor to that tier of people. Because it's happening whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. If you're hesitant to jump in that space because you feel like you haven't gotten enough experience yet, I think that's valid. But at the same time, I think going forward in the industry, especially given what happened this year with COVID and gym shut down, I mean, I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, and thankfully our government is probably not going to do anything again to close anything. But, uh, you know, my friends in Toronto now have been uh, shut down again. And obviously California and my gym owner friends down there, uh, they're still not open. So what does that leave you with? Well, oh, shit, I've been training for, you know, one year and and three months, but I'm not allowed to train online. So I'm just going to have to starve and, and get out of the industry. The coaches don't think that way. They're going to be helping their clients online, the ones who were there with them in person. And I think now you're going to see the new model of becoming a trainer is going to involve more of a hybrid process where they learn and develop online businesses earlier. It doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be as qualified as someone who's done it for four or five years, but the educational resources will also be there via people sharing you know, career advice, how to do it well. And of course, through John Goodman's work uh, and the Online Trainer Academy. So if anyone's been kind of dug in in that position, I think I would challenge that to keep more of a mind about mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point, a very fair point. And I think uh, you're right. Well, obviously, jo- John Goodman's doing a great job. There'll be probably copycats uh, and you know, tr- trying to mimic that because more than ever now, being the person with the syllabus for how to build an online trainer uh, career is is valuable information. And, and you know, we're going to find that in all uh, different um industries and but but i think online education is now ripe for an explosion obviously fitness education will be one but just standard um ed- education as well given the the situation we find ourselves in and people will you know will invest in that now uh, so that'll be very interesting and then also as people get used to learning online they'll perhaps be uh, more comfortable delivering uh, a service online as well and and that will that will speed the process which I mean, I think as long, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're good, cream, cream rises to the top. So, you know, it's still, the work's still there to be done. It's just a different uh, different uh, sort of stream of how you get there in the end. Um, now, one other topic I wanted to talk to you about quickly uh, that sort of sprang to mind uh, on some of the stuff we were saying earlier, but, you know, putting information out into the world, uh, did you struggle with any kind of imposter syndrome? Um, did that hold you back at any point or did you just, you know, work? Were you able just to just think, screw it, I'm going to put this out there if people like it? Uh, I think it's valuable. I, I know I've experienced it. There's definitely been times where I've been on the gym floor and you know teaching and demonstrating things and things are clicking, but yet at the same time, I'm like, just sort of mystified that I'm even in this position, uh, you know, feeling like it's like, it, it just doesn't make sense. So yeah, there's always that. And, and there would have been many stages earlier in my career where if someone said to me here, you know, you're going to... Uh, you know, get up on stage and MC a conference, which, you know, Dean Somerset and I do here at Edmonton, which we had to cancel this year, um, or, you know, be writing for a publication that I, you know, come up and read, I'd be like, there's no fucking way in hell. I'm, you know, I, I couldn't do this sort of thing. I don't think I was ever crippled by it. I think I just didn't have these crazy aspirations early on. Like I said, you know, it was a passion that I found versus one that I followed. So things seem to evolve organically. And as, you know, opportunities arose because of my nature of naturally meeting people, I'm outgoing, I'm gregarious. Uh, the business on the floor was always there. I always did the referral business well, always coach clients and, you know, approach it with a professional mindset. So that always seemed to be fairly strong. And I was always very centric towards, okay, I've got to make sure I'm busy. I've got to make sure I'm doing this number of sessions a month, um, you know, 
that, that was always in the forefront. So then the experience just accumulated. And so for me, I think at various different junctures, you know, when my friends asked me to do a podcast, instead of going, oh, shit, that'd be terrible. I'd be like, hey, OK, that's a pretty cool idea. I like podcasts. So it's a question of, you know, putting in the reps and then as opportunities arose through experience and connections, then, you know, I I deliberately stepped through those hoops. I don't know if I necessarily went out of my way to beat down those doors. I think a lot of opportunities have just happened through connections and I was ready for those. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people now, especially younger people who are probably a little bit more, you know, knocking on doors or trying to beat them down. And I, I admire that. And I think that's a great idea, but uh, I, I think you could be a bit more vulnerable to imposter syndrome or <laughs> worse. The people who are knocking down those doors, uh, you know, aren't experiencing it and maybe they're not ready for some of this stuff. So, uh, it's a very real phenomenon, and here's what I always say about it. If you are experiencing imposter syndrome, I take that as a good sign. That tells me that you are caring and conscientious, that you want to do a really good job and you want to help people, and you are nervous about you know your qualifications, which tells me that you will continue to always strive to be better at what you're doing and learn more. Mm-hmm. And, that's a, and that will put you in a strong position, even if you don't yet feel you're ready. I also think that if you wait until you feel ready, you will wait forever. So you will have to take some chances. Yes, yes, I think that's uh, wise advice. There, um, you know, there's there's no perfect time, as we're all fond of telling people with their dietary training uh, changes or, or a training plan. You know, waiting for the perfect opportunity, it, it will never arrive. So th- that's key. Um, and then uh, maybe referencing back to that discussion we had about online coaching and people transitioning to that. There's no perfect timeline for this. You don't have to have done ten years on the gym floor before you can write your first article for a major publication. There'll be some people that it does take that long. Um, I mean, I've been, I think, before I started submitting articles to, to websites. I think I had done probably more than 10 years, but I'd written some some blogs and things and I'd you know maybe written for some friends' websites, but I hadn't, I hadn't ever tried to get into the bigger ones. Um, but then there'll be someone else who's, you know, maybe just a really good writer and, or, you know, or they pick these things up that bit quicker. They could be two years into their career and they're published all over the place. Um, and, and, and you, you know, that there's going to be a, a huge range. There's no perfect time. But as you say, I think don't be paralyzed by waiting, waiting for the perfect moment. Um, now, this is, this is, again, a little bit for my benefit, but as someone who has to put content out there, but also, you know, I train uh, on the gym floor. Uh, currently, I'm in the gym four days a week training people. Uh, scheduling, how do you go about planning your content creation? You've got to write articles. You've got to do social media posts. Uh, are you very structured? Do you have some kind of framework, how you put that together? Structure is probably too strong a word. I mean, I base it primarily around my in-client schedule, right? I have a certain number of hours and I work my historical average, this is not a high point, this is historical average, is about 135 to 140 sessions per month. So I at least six to seven days a week, and I enjoy that. There'll be a few on the weekends. So what often happens is as a client makes a comment or something, I think, oh, that's wonderful. So I work with a tablet, so I'll make a note, and I'll even tell the client, listen, you just gave me a great idea for something on social media. They love that. Or if it's something that's been rattling around in my brain, then that'll often take care of the uh, of the social media. And uh, I've been super swamped the last few days, so I actually didn't get a chance to get ahead on that. So I took a couple of old posts and just tweaked the wording a little bit, and I reshared them, even acknowledging that they were reshares. And they performed extraordinarily well, kind of like what we said earlier, where there's a lot of fresh eyes on them. And they got shared, and I actually found a whole bunch of new followers as a result of that. But for the most part, yeah, I try to have, you know, fresh organic ideas. It usually comes from just the the on the floor experience or whatever's rattling around in my brain. And I document it in my notes. So that way you don't forget it. If I'm in the shower and an idea pops in my head, you wouldn't believe how, you know, often you get ideas in the shower and there's some science behind why that works. Then, you know, sometimes I'll literally reach out of the shower, hop out, put it in my phone, (laughs) and then hop back in the shower because I don't want to lose this great idea. So that tends to take care of that. Um, and then I write a, a career article once a month on a deadline for True Coach. That one I usually, you know, sit down and kind of brainstorm, okay, what do I want to talk about and say? And I submit the idea and they, they approve it. With Teen Nation, as, as you know all too well, they, they don't, we're not on a schedule as much. You just kind of create ideas, which can also not create enough pressure for you to, to, you know, do it too frequently. I'll go through little bursts and then I'll have something where I haven't given them anything in a month or whatever because I get too busy otherwise. 
but then I let ideas marinate. Something came to me last night and I thought, Hey shit, I should really do this. And, you know, I had a, an idea where, uh, you know, another industry friend of mine had been doing something very similar. We've been sharing the same idea on our social media with a particular exercise we're doing. So I haven't reached out yet, but I'm going to reach out to him and say, Hey, do you want to collaborate on this? And I would do the legwork for the most part, cause I know he's a busy dude and just say, here, would you like maybe write this section and, uh, you know, a video of you doing this. So I haven't even approached it yet, but it's an idea. So I've written it down and then I'm going to see if, if I can run with that. And yeah, it's just, if, if I get a cancellation or certain blocks of time, yeah, I will set those pieces of time aside to sit down and write. So try to use my time as, as well as possible because otherwise you'll never get anything done, especially mm-hmm. if you're scrolling social media the whole time. And then if every once in a while I feel like I'm a little bit behind, well, I might take a Friday night or a Saturday night and say, okay, well, I'm going to sit down for three or four hours and I'm just going to pound keys and get ahead and work on this stuff. And on top of that, I also, within blocks of my schedule, I sort of have a little window, uh, usually on Wednesday evenings where I record my podcast and that's a weekly commitment. So then I have to schedule a guest and... I also have to write up, uh, you know, some questions. So wherever I can find the time, I make sure that's done. So I find just having a deadline on a lot of this stuff, like, all right, shit, well, I got to get this done. So here's where I'm going to do it. Scheduling this stuff and not being haphazard about it, I think is one of the best things you can do. Um, and then if you want to go as far as having a, a content calendar schedule, which some people do to plan out your month, great. I don't work that far ahead. That's not how my mind seems to work too much. But, and I, I think if you, you want to be a successful writer, it's not a bad idea to block off time that is dedicated to writing. I found that my mind still defaults to clients and client schedule first, and then the writing fits in on top of it. Because at the end of the day, you know, the clients do pay quite a bit more than the writing gigs. It's sort of a myth that, you know, oh, you're writing for Teen Nation and these other things, and, you know, you get paid a whole lot of money. I promise you, given the amount of time it takes to put in to an article and then refine and editing it, Writing the article doesn't take that much time. The editing process is where the real stuff happens. If you're an aspiring writer and you're struggling with, oh, I've written this, it looks like crap, and then I read all these other people, it's all so good. I promise you, our first drafts are just as bad, maybe worse than what you're doing. And it's the revision and editing process that does tease out the end product. You end up chopping a lot of superfluous language. You edit weaker language into stronger language. Use active versus passive uh, wording and you just clean out clutter like the word that just do a search for the word that in your thing if you find eight to ten examples you probably shouldn't need to use it more than once if at all you will you pull it out and you'll realize how much stronger the sentences will sound and how unnecessary that particular word is as i use it in the description uh, and there will be other things as you practice this stuff. There's a few books like On Writing Well by Zinzer that I recommend everybody. If you're interested in writing, go read that book. It, it's an end user being accessible. Uh, and it's going to be a lot better than not to pooing a university degree in English. I've done university level English stuff. But the way that they teach writing isn't necessarily the way you write for the common end user. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. So I didn't know that you'd done uh, any, you know, in terms of uh, any university writing. Um, so my background, you know, because people talk about, oh, how did you get into writing? Uh, well, I was a professional rugby player for three years till I got a knee injury, never played again. Then I trained clients for 10 years and then wrote some terrible articles, which got slightly better over time. Uh, but I suppose if you read enough articles without realizing it, you kind of are understanding, okay, this is how a good article, you know, because you'll remember the articles that held your attention and you you went all the way through to the end. Um, and, and back in the day, they could be quite long articles. Now they tend to be that little bit shorter, you know, the attention um span is, is shorter now um but then you know you're kind of learning the whole time if you're exposing yourself to good writers um that are knowledgeable you you find that you you know p- pick up those tips and then it's just a case of iterating as you say you you get your you get your thoughts down on on paper or on the keyboard they're not going to be organized in a really great fashion and very easy to read but you read it back to yourself and one tip is if you read it out to yourself out loud then you'll realize just um quite how good or bad it may sound and then and then you you work from there and then your first article probably takes you an outrageous amount of time per word to get to the point where it's actually usable and then like anything with practice you get you get better and you get to the point where you can actually put together an article and it's your first draft's actually not that far that away from you know you don't have to do draft 57 like you used to the uh with the first few articles 
Absolutely. I mean, I remember the first one I, you know, got published for Two Nation. I put a lot of bloody effort in that because I didn't want to make a fool of myself going back to you know, imposter syndrome. But yeah, there's a big part of me that's thinking, you know, hey, I don't deserve to be here alongside of these people that I consider to be legends of, of this industry and, and many of whom are who taught me the formative philosophies and techniques behind training. I'm like, what the fuck is am I doing here? But I put in an effort and, and like you said, exactly. I have the same experience. It just gets a little bit easier and a little bit smoother. And you have a bit more confidence in your, in your own ability. And you realize nobody is ripping it apart. People are not concerned with tearing you apart or tearing you down. This, this goes to the idea of content creation as well. If you are scared to share your content, I don't, I don't know, Tom, if you've had this experience earlier in your career where you're worried that people would criticize you or, or say something. Well, first of all, you probably don't have a large enough following early on to have a lot of people coming at you, okay? Uh, unless you're using like hashtag keto and then criticizing keto. I promise you the keto zealots will descend upon your page and, and be a pain in your ass. But if you don't share your knowledge because you're afraid of what uh, negative people or trolls might say, or worse, we all have those people that are there on our social media and honestly, stop following these people that you don't like, that make you kind of feel crappy when you when, when you see what they're doing or or you resent. If you have it, that sort of feeling, it's a human thing, unfollow those people, get, get rid of that negative stimulus, but some of those people will follow you. If you're worried about their criticism, you're worried about the wrong people. The people who really matter are the people who like you, who really would benefit from what you have to say, who would learn, who would, you know, maybe see major lifestyle changes. I get a lot of, a lot of positive feedback about the stuff I share on Instagram. Those are the people I'm there for. And I am not concerned if someone pops in and decides that they're going to throw a temper tantrum and shit all over my wall. Um, that person isn't going to be a paying customer and they're, and they're not someone who's sharing my work. I mean, their comments, sure, bump the post a little bit, fine, fuck it. But I think if you can approach those people with civility and, you know, not be this asshole on the internet, which everybody, a lot of people seem to want to do, then the people who are watching will notice that too. But, you know, you've got to get those ideas out there and you cannot be afraid of the disapproval of people that don't matter, who don't care about you. And your failure would reward those people. They would be happy to see you not try. So by not trying or being afraid to try, you're serving them while not serving the people that care about you. Mm -hmm. Really hope that people take that hold. And I don't know if you've ever had a similar experience early when you started out with this stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely been some moments along that path. And I think that's a key thing for people to think of is actually the way you get better is by making mistakes learning from them and, and then making fewer mistakes or refining your approach and having someone actually in some, some respects, the haters can be your best friends because they'll point out flaws, uh, potentially, and sometimes they'll just be idiots and you can ignore it and they're doing it because they're a keyboard warrior and, uh, they know that there's, there's, there's no, 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 no comeback from you other than, you know, maybe blocking them. They can, I mean, I don't know. My, my, one of my clients has the phrase telephone t- tough guy. People will call you up and, uh, and say things to you that they would never say in person, but the, uh, you know, social media and Instagram really, uh, magnifies that approach. But sometimes having those people make, uh, question you mean you think a little bit deeper and you can either explain things better or refine your approach. So I think that's great. The other thing is not to get too caught up in your following. I mean, as we said, it's useful. Um, it, it, it immediately lends you a bit of a uh, bit more credibility. I think if you have a high following. But one one thing, you know, I did with with lockdown here. We were in lockdown for basically uh, borderline six months. Um, I was at home, got two kids. Um, at first, I put pressure on myself to try and churn out content and be able to homeschool them. That wasn't happening. So in the end, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do the minimum effective. I will look after my clients online, my existing clients. I'm not going to post on social media. Then you come back to social media and you haven't been there for six months and the way Instagram works, all of a sudden now, if I put something out there, it's it's not getting the same engagement. I'm actually dropping some followers because people that maybe were following me before because they'd forgotten they followed me. Now they're reminded my my ugly face and they're like, oh, I don't want to see that guy. They're on following. But but don't don't stress about that because the way I see it is that I, they're filtering down to the people that actually want to hear the message and can take value from it. So basically it's yeah, one one big message is try not to get too caught up in the vanity of the metrics. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and put, put your best work out there. And if you keep doing that long enough and you're good enough, then, you know, you'll help enough people and, and that will take care of it. You'll drive yourself crazy to get caught up in the metrics, but there can be, 
valuable lessons. I mean, if you notice that you're writing things and you tend to write one type of post or use a certain type of language and it does well, and then another type doesn't do as well. Well, okay, learn from that. But you know, it it don't like have a day where oh, I didn't gain any followers for you know two days in a row and I shared something and then let that crawl up inside your head and go oh, that's it. You know, I'll never gain another person again. That's not how it works. And like you said, you know, if you are consistent. There will be times where you don't get much traction, but over the long run, it adds up in a very significant way. It may feel very incremental, but uh, I don't know if you've read the book, The Compound Effect or The Slight Edge, either of them. They, they talk about the same principle. If anyone listening, you know, if you're struggling with, you know, building momentum on something, these books are great because you know, they, they take the myth of instant overnight success. It is this gradual incremental idea of reading 10 pages of good literature a day. Imagine you add that up over a year in terms of how many books you'll have gotten through and things that will influence your philosophies and your approach to how you, um, you know, train your clients and build your business. This stuff adds up. Yeah, 100%. Um, right, well, we, we've done, a, I think, a pretty good job of covering Instagram, the, the, the good, the bad, the, the building uh, building a brand. Um, let's maybe talk a little bit training-wise now. It's be, I you know, feel like we waste our time if we hadn't picked your brains there a little bit. And uh, I've done, I've uh, let some of the uh, the heavy lifting here be done by some followers on Instagram, talking, you know, bringing it back to that. Uh, I asked the guys, you know, if they had any questions. Now, there's a few that have come in. Now, one one's uh, going to be interesting. Okay, let's do this one. So they're talking about uh, exercise variation. We're talking hyper feet um so you know or, or body composition change certainly uh, not not for strength progress as such but um how much their, their question essentially is how many uh how much variation do i need per body part uh is it possible to build as much muscle just doing one exercise for a body part so they say for example if i just do leg press can i how how much uh, of my potential am i missing out on what are your thoughts on that oh, a couple of problems with just doing one exercise and I, I don't think anybody really does this and let's use the leg press as an example you're getting a lot of repetitive use okay and the leg press is a very heavy one at that so while you'll have a lot of tension in the muscles you're having the exact same tension unless you're doing things like changing foot placement and, and tempo so over time it's going to be a good muscle building strategy for for quads primarily but you may accumulate just some wear and tear on your joints. I also don't think you can really do enough effective volume with leg press um, to optimally grow your entire legs, right? You need some hamstring work, direct work, glutes, you know, something like a Romanian deadlift would take, um, you know, would, do, would do really well with that. Lunges or split squat variations or, or just squatting. Now, if you're someone who's loading up the leg press and doing half range of motion, but say you can't squat because your knees hurt, well, fundamentally, there's something wrong with your approach. I'm sorry. You need to learn how to do a squat properly. And if you, if you physically can't do a squat because of, you know, joint issues, then you probably shouldn't be anywhere near a bloody leg press. You should be talking to a good physical therapist, right? Um, the leg press can't be a default when I don't know if there's a certain amount of variation that you quote need, but you know, let's say you're doing different kinds of rows, you know, you have a seated cable row or a dumbbell row or a barbell row. Well, there's still different physics working on the row in different positions. So, and I'm not an expert in the deepest of the biomechanics and the stuff, and nor does anyone listening have to be just hit muscles from slightly different angles, which will optimally stimulate more muscle fiber. Um, I think for efficiency for building muscle, we know that training within that 7 to 12 classic range is most efficient. You can build muscle effectively in rep ranges of 1 to 5. You can build muscle in 15 to 20 plus reps. The problem with 1 to 5 reps is you need a lot of rest due to the you know anaerobic demands of the energy systems you're using. It's very heavy. It's tough on the joints. It's not a very efficient way to accumulate a lot of mechanical tension, one of the key drivers of muscle growth. And then the sets of 15, well, certainly 20 to 30 reps and above, you know, it drives a lot of metabolic stress. And that's my attitude towards that is that's a bit more of a byproduct of a lot of mechanical tension and the things that build muscle versus itself being a super important driver of muscle growth. But it's it's in there. I mean, when was the last time you did 30 reps of something? It felt terrible. You know, you do that through across your entire workout. 
So once again, uh, sprinkle a bit of that in there, especially with some isolation work. But the bulk of your hypertrophy training is probably going to work most efficiently for time and for not beating the hell out of your, your joints within that 8 to 12 rep range. So that's really critical. And then there's also these the mental aspects of it. I mean, who the fuck is going to sit on a leg press and do, you know, what, 20 sets and there's my leg workout? That's fucking boring. That's bloody boring. Right. And doing that week in, week out. I mean, hell no. So, yes, adding some variation uh, with diff- across different exercises is a good idea. I think you know, people who are changing their entire program every month to six weeks. It's far too frequent. You're not layering the work on the same muscle lines um, for long enough. So, you know, anyone who craves that kind of variation, then maybe instead of wholesale rebuilding the workout, Maybe substitute your seated cable rows for your dumbbell rows or do a, you know, a meadows row instead of the dumbbell row or something that is similar enough so the overall program is still fairly comparable. You know, Maybe your Romanian deadlift becomes a heavy single leg deadlift for a while. right? Maybe you change your stance on your leg press. Maybe your back squat becomes a front squat. Maybe your lunge becomes a Bulgarian split squat without, you know, oh, I'm going to do CrossFit this month. The next month it's powerlifting. I mean, next month it's calisthenics. And then I don't think, I think those are straw man arguments. I don't think most people really do that sort of stuff. I think it's more the general population person who doesn't understand versus a dedicated person, the guy who wants to build a lot of muscle. But I, I think speaking to the psychological aspect of actually enjoying your training and sticking with it long term, a little bit of variation keeps it interesting. And then it'll keep you doing the things that really matter. I hope I've answered that question I think, yeah, I mean, it was a broad question. It's one of those ones it's tough to give an answer, but we've got some really good points there. I think one of those is the psychological element. So um, you can have what's, you know, quote unquote, an, an optimal or scientific training plan, whatever you want. But if if you're not motivated to put the requisite effort in to get results, then it's not going to produce results. So you need something that gets you excited to train and push hard. So um, some level of variety definitely helps with that. Uh, and, you know, avoiding it from being too boring, your, your sort of 20 sets example brings back memories of my first time doing GVT and just being, you know, mind numbing. But I think so a little plug from here as I've written articles on strategic variation, which is a kind of an amalgamation of ideas from Mike Israel, Tom Purvis and, and uh, Andy Galpin in terms of how we go about v- uh, varying things to um, get the best results. And I, I think that's worth looking into. Um, certainly when it comes to exercise selection, you, you're not going to build your biggest physique doing just one exercise for each muscle group and and another concept i think to touch on there you talked about the biomechanics that if you look at the you know the the providing a full contractile right range challenge so in the fully length and a shortened position in the mid range um you're going to need a variety of exercises to achieve that no exercise is going to to do that for all of those that's a consideration but otherwise i you know i echo all of the things you said um i think really really good points and I'll illustrate the example about the different positions for fully stretched. You know, think about glute training, right? You know, uh, barbell hip thrusts, which are super popular. And some people just have this idea that, oh, they're trash, blah, 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 Brett Contreras, blah, blah. You got to get over that, guys. It's a valuable exercise. It's not the only thing in that work. I know. Completely fraudulent that everybody's waving around saying, look, squats are better. No, it's nuanced. But you train the glutes in a stretched position. Their peak tension in a stretch position at the bottom of a squat versus, uh, and that's a, a flex tip. And then with a barbell hip thrust, you get peak tension at the extended position at the top. So they're opposite ends of it. And you can sprinkle in things like um, like hyperextensions on top of it to get a full spectrum of training for the glutes. Yeah, yeah. And then you've, you think it's a complementary uh, thing. So the other thing I would uh, make on that point is you don't have to train the whole contractile range uh, in one session. But across the course of a program, you're going to need to target all of those. Um, and that's one, one way you can have a variety from one to the next. So you talked about effective volume. And I think that's useful because one of the other questions is talking about how someone regulates volume and intensity. So the interplay between those two. Um, and then I'd also like if we uh, move, move on from that. Do you use volume as a way to overload people for hypertrophy? Uh, so let's quickly talk about the relationship between volume and intensity, if you don't mind. And then we'll, we'll investigate that whole volume threshold and, and progression potentially 
It's something that, you know, people in the industry argue. I tend to default to, you mentioned Mike Isertel earlier, and I tend to default to Mike Isertel's philosophies, and, and he's very evidence-based in it. And there are other individuals in our industry who, you know, get a far more bro, and they'll argue counterpoints. But, but I think Mike is a good starting place where you look at his concept of maximum recoverable volume, minimum, minimum effective dose. And it sounds like you kind of come from that same place. I look at trying to maximize mechanical tension and volume of tough sets, volume of hard sets. Um, I think that people who are caught up in balls to the wall intensity, while sprinkled in is a great idea, you can't build truly impressive muscle, you know, hey, I got to turn sideways through a door kind of muscle without having a lot of intensity in your workouts. But if every set is taken past failure, you're going to accumulate fatigue faster than you accumulate training effect, which is going to set you back a long run. And plus, you're probably going to deal with, you know, overuse injuries or even acute injuries. So it, it's going to vary by person. It's going to vary by muscle group. And it can be something that I think if you document your numbers and put it in a spreadsheet, if you want to get that technical or at least make a lot of notes, then you can follow the number of effective sets that you're doing every week. Right? I think it's pretty sound to try to take your working sets to within a rep or two of failure. That seems to be a good type of a balance of volume and intensity. And then across a week, you know, if you continue to add maybe a set here or a set there to increase the overall volume, add a little bit of failure, add a little bit of post-failure training to the last set of major exercises, uh, just not squats. That just sucks. It feels terrible. Then I think you're going to be on the right track. If you're caught up in the idea of, oh, I got to squeeze out optimized training and, you know, getting all these equations of stuff, I, I, I don't think that's necessary for anybody but, you know, high level bodybuilders on Olympia stage. Uh, I think you just learn the lessons from what you've been doing. If you document the process and if you notice, okay, you know, I did 16 sets of, you know, biceps this week and my biceps feel like they're going to fall off. And the next week I couldn't do half of that. Well, quote, you're probably over training or under recovering that muscle group. And I'll, I'll hit on under recovery, over training really quickly. You know, you also got to look at your sleep and your nutrition, your hydration, these sort of things, right? Fuck supplements. You know, you can add in your creatine and obviously protein powder. That's food anyway. But all this other sort of stuff, does this shit work? No, like get, get sleep. You know, you hear it all the time, but you know, people still don't fucking listen. If you're not sleeping enough, none of this other sort of shit even matters, right? Your blood glucose regulation sucks if you're not sleeping enough and yet you're doing that extra hour of cardio, you know, before bed and then you can't sleep. And then you give yourself five hours. Well, shit, you're fucking yourself anyway. You're far better off getting that sleep than, than getting up on the treadmill. You know, go look at your nutrition, cut the calories there instead. Um, but back on track, if you notice that, yeah, you're constantly feeling just beaten the hell up. Well, okay, you're probably overtraining a little bit. Dial it back a little bit. Make the quality of the sets better. Emphasize the mechanical tension of that individual set. And once you tinker with it and found what seems to work for you, then you should be able to add progressive volume. And again. Adding sets can be valuable in short cycles, but it can become prohibitively time. Uh, can, uh, it can become time prohibitive to just keep doing that. You can't be doing fifty or sixty sets of you know chest each week. I, mean, I don't think anybody's going to do well on that. Right? We don't have time for it. And where do you train your legs? Oh, just wear your you know gym pants, bro. <laughs> where you your legs? I, can't, I don't think that. I can. Um. But I don't know if, I mean, people argue about it to the point where I don't think there is a very simple, concise answer. Um, I just think that Mike's approach, Mike Isertel's approach, is probably the best starting point. Mm -hmm. So, yes. I'll bounce it back to you, see what you think about that same topic. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, some, well, first of all, uh, play that back to yourself if you want some useful insight into volume, because I think you, you gave some great takeaways there, but people kind of might miss them if they just uh, just listen straight through. So go back and, and think how you can apply those concepts to yourself. So I would very much agree, big fan of Mike's work, actually going to try and get him on the show uh, as soon as possible. But so definitely agree with the way you've described volume. And I, I don't think I have too much to, to add there, particularly. Uh, and I want to echo the sleep and diet thing, right? So your two most powerful recovery tools 
are sleep and nutrition. And if you're not taking care of those, then frankly, you're not going to get any results. And this is a mistake I made. Uh, I'm always looking, you know, looking for the sexy new training protocol that was going to give you the gains or the expensive supplement. Little did I know an extra hour of sleep and actually ticking the boxes of my nutrition was going to be that powerful tool. And it's a hard lesson to learn, but one that's great when you do learn it because you suddenly start recovering, performing better in the gym. And it's this, this uh, sort of virtual sort uh, virtuous cycle. So that and then the only point I had when it came to the volume thing was I think a period of time when you do go balls to wall, you train to failure is useful. And the real reason I think that is really useful is it teaches you what failure actually is. So it means you can use reps in reserve in your training long term, which is going to be a really powerful tool for you if you apply it properly. The problem is people come out of the gate, they've they've read one article, they start training, they try and train with reps in reserve, but they've never been to failure. So that they have no idea. It's a skill to be able to know how close to failure you are and how many reps in reserve you have. And one of the best ways to learn that skill is to actually train to failure. So uh, a period of time, maybe when you're, I don't know if we're going to bracket things as an early intermediate, perhaps is the right time, in my opinion, to to have that phase. And then that great, uh, gives you a great reference point for from then on in terms of pushing to failure and how close to failure you are. Yeah, a lot of you know beginner, intermediate, pe- intermediate people what you think is failure isn't failure. And then there's also, I suppose, an important concept too is strict form failure versus absolute failure. There are things like, and I am not one of these people that thinks that, oh, cheating, you know, people make all kinds of excuses to validate cheating. Cheating is ego lifting. It's complete bullshit. And I don't get into absolutes or or hard statements very often, but, you know, all these mental gymnastics people come up with, to justify the fact that they just want to use heavier weight and they give a shit about what people around the gym, you know, think about the, you know, their shoulder laterals. Meanwhile, their hips are getting a good work. It is bullshit. Like it, it's absolute bullshit, right? Get this stuff strict. You're going to get better mechanical tension on your target muscle if you do it strict. And then, uh, you know, I, I suppose if you do a couple of reps that have got a little bit of English on them on a, on a side dumbbell lateral, no big deal. But if you try to go past strict form failure on a squat, uh, a deadlift or uh, these other big compounds, especially anytime your spine is loaded, then you're asking for trouble. Terrible shit's going to happen. Or if your leg is coming up as you're doing a bench press, we've all seen the clients who, who do that. Like all of a sudden they're twisting one of their shoulders comes off the bench and they push out another two reps. Like, fuck no, don't, don't do that stuff. Don't do that stuff with your clients. Um, drill down on really great technique. And then as you gain more experience, you will know, where you can push another rep out of it. And then there's nothing wrong with, you know, doing drop sets. I like going past failure on things like seated cable rows or, you know, a, a run the rack with dumbbell curls or something vicious on the last set. Okay, I can't squeeze out another rep. All right, cool. Pause, take two breaths, do another rep. Good, all right. Now, put those dumbbells down, you know, grab a lighter set and do it again and do that at four or five times down the rack or start with the 50s and do every increment down to the fives once every, you know, six to eight weeks or whatever. You want to make your biceps grow, do evil shit like that. But again, keep the form strict. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, th- I think it's knowing how to apply that and when to sensibly apply that. Those those are concepts that work well on uh, you know, exercises you can go to to failure safely. Um, they're not great for your back squat, your deadlift. But you know, you're doing something like that on a leg extension or a, or a lateral. You, you know, you're less likely to get in trouble because the stimulus fatigue ratio, the risk return ratios, you know, it's it's more in your favour. So just be smart about you how you apply these principles, basically. All right, Andrew, we, I know I don't, we're, we're getting close up on time. I don't want, well, in fact, we're overrun slightly. So we'll, um, if you can hang on for a couple of minutes, I've got a quick fire, either or questions for you. And then, and a couple, a couple more just to finish, wrap, wrap things up. So Good. pizza or burger? Uh, pizza. Chocolate or peanut butter? Uh, uh, so, uh, ch- again? Chocolate or peanut butter? Oh, chocolate. I think peanut butter is this most overrated obsession with fitness industry. I don't understand why these fitness girls are so fucking caught up in this bullshit. It's so overrated. <laughs> All right. Uh, you don't do it absolutes often except for peanut butter. Uh, <laughs> absolute there. Uh, beach holiday or city break? <sighs> what do you mean by city break? Because I'm guessing that's a, a more of a British term. Okay, yeah. So for, for someone like me, right, so... It would be like uh, flying to Spain, going to Madrid, for example, like city for a weekend, check out a city for a long weekend, uh, exploring the city as opposed to just chilling out on the beach. Now, I like city breaks. Uh, I found in my travels, I like going to other cities for fitness conferences, stuff like that. So I, I like that. I went to Mexico last year, 
and it was like stormy the whole time. All right. Okay. Uh, steak, rare or well done? Medium rare. Well Medium. done. Out of my house. Exactly. All right. Good. good. Is the correct answer. Uh, scrambled or poached for eggs? Scrambled. Okay. Now, next question. Tell me something about yourself that we probably don't know. So someone's followed your work, but they don't know this about you. Any any skeletons in the closet you can share with us? Any, any surprising stories? Uh, you know, I grew up um, as a, I don't know, I didn't have a lot of friends growing up in school. I went to a, a school, my graduating class was nine people in a tiny town in northern Newfoundland in eastern Canada. And I would spend a lot of my time playing video games and immersed in Dungeons and Dragons books versus, I also was a high school athlete, but I wasn't a popular kid. Ah, okay, okay, interesting. Yeah, and that is a small class. You said nine kids. Nine. Wow. Yeah, that that's that's well, that's small. God, nothing else to add to that, but that is that is small. Right. Next. Well, and final question from me: Who should I interview next? So we've thrown around a lot of names, and uh, obviously, you've already said you're going to get uh, Mike Isatel. He will do your podcast, I'm sure of it. But uh, my friend Robert Linkle. Okay. Is uh, he's a gym owner in virtually certainly he's in Sacramento, he's in California, and I've seen him present a few times, and he's considered to be one of the leading authorities in our industry on training older adults, okay. so elder population. Uh, he's himself around my age, he's about 40, but he's had you know a lung removed, hip replacements, he comes from a, a throwing background, so he beat up his body pretty bad, so he, he'll say when you know a 65 or 70 year old man looks at him, and says, well, what makes you qualified to train me? And he's like, well, my body's been through 70 years worth of, of shit. And he's a really, really genuine guy, really intelligent, and again, a brilliant, brilliant person at being able to train older adults. And for anyone listening, you know, this whole niching thing, you don't have to specialize here, but, you know, going forward, this is the cohort, the age group that has the, on average, the most financial resources and the greatest need. And I think given what's happened in the world, People have for a very long time not changed their behavior due to long, far off threats of high blood pressure or lifestyle diseases like diabetes. It it just doesn't motivate people to change. Um, COVID has shaken people up a little bit. It will not fundamentally shift our entire society, but I believe it will cause a certain number of people to decide, hey, this is scary. There's a direct relationship between these lifestyle diseases and severity of COVID outcomes. We now know that, and it scales with age, right? Those diseases, those problems are more prevalent in our older society. So I believe that group of people, especially because they have the financial resources, will probably start looking to our industry for help. So it's a good space to be in, and it is a good thing to be able to work with that population. And my friend Robert is really, really brilliant at uh, you know creating programs and and how to approach that and beating up on a lot of the misconceptions. Like you don't have older adults sitting down on machines the whole time. They actually need to be down on the ground and moving around and uh, retaining skills uh, and developing things that they may have lost um, because you know sitting in a machine isn't very useful to them if they have a, a slip and fall. You know, being resilient to being able to get back up again. Is, is far more valuable. And I, I enjoy working with my older adults. Um, they're great to spend time around. Uh, it's something I really look forward to. And I'll leave with this thought. The people that you work with affect your mental energy. And if I have people in my schedule cluttered up with people who are draining and negative and, and difficult and stressful, then it's very, very difficult not to carry that into dread going into them. And, and I need to guard my mental energy very carefully to be able to do the session volume that I do. So, and it doesn't mean, oh, this person's kind of annoying sometimes. I'm firing them. I hate the idea of trainers bragging about firing clients. But in the grand scheme of things, you sort of have to ask yourself, am I working with people that uh, energize me and lift me up? Or am I working with people that I dread seeing and are really draining? And I promise you, as much as you may think you need that money from that one client who is a pain in the ass, who always pays late, who cancels all the time, uh, you'd be surprised when you let some of those people go, how much better you feel and the better energy you have with everyone else. And you'll start to see that you, you'll get some better clients that will replace those people that make you feel that way. So give some serious consideration into guarding against letting energy vampires or people that cause you too much stress 
uh, who really aren't worth it in the end, but you feel that you need, uh, I don't think you really need them. Yep, oh, 100. That's fantastic career advice. Let's we'll, we'll finish on that. That's a, that's a great takeaway for people. So, guys, um, now Andrew, please take a moment just to tell everyone where they can find out a little bit more about you. Uh, get into your world on uh, in the online space. Well, I've been most active on Instagram, so I would say go follow me there, uh, Andrew Coates Fitness. Uh, yeah, I have a website. I haven't been super active on it lately because most of my writing has been for Team Nation through Coach, but there is that. Uh, and then, of course, if if you like anything I've said, I, I also like it when people message me to have specific questions. Please, you can message me on Instagram or, or comment or interact with the stuff I'm posting. So that is absolutely the best place to engage. Okay. Instagram, we'll make sure uh, we get that uh, link in the show notes so everyone can go there. Andrew, thank you very much for taking the time to chat. It's been uh, really, really good to connect and I think loads of value for the listener there. So thank you. I appreciate it. This has been wonderful. I'm going to... I've got a backlog of stuff, but I'm going to be bringing out you on in my podcast in the future as well because I want to flip the script and, uh, and get your thoughts. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, happy to do that. That'd be uh, that'd be great. More than more than happy to come uh, come on and uh, chat again. All right, thanks, my friend. I hope you have a wonderful day, and everyone listening, thank you for uh, staying with us. Awesome. That wraps up today's episode. Thank you so much for investing your time with us. We really appreciate it. If you enjoyed what you heard and took value from it, please do me a favor by heading to iTunes right now, subscribing to the show, and leaving a review. Positive reviews, you know, like five stars, hint, hint, really help the ranking of the show and will help us to spread the word and keep getting top class guests on. Make sure to follow Breaking Muscle on social media and me, at Tom McCormick, that's T-O-M-M-A-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K on Instagram. Bye for now, and I'm looking forward to catching you on the next episode of the Breaking Muscle Podcast.